We are going to be continuing this morning in our sermon series on three kings as we're doing uh, character studies in the life of Saul and David and Solomon. And we're going to pick up actually in part two dealing with the sin and failure of King David. And before we get to talking about sin and consequences, it, it's fitting that we have the opportunity to gather around the Lord's table this morning, which is that powerful reminder of how Christ has paid for our sins. And there is forgiveness and there is grace. And we do not need to be trapped forever in the consequences and the condemnation that our sins would earn us. Um, however, sins do have consequences. And the consequence ultimately was that Jesus Christ had to go to the cross to die for sinners. But they also have temporary consequences in this life. And we, we would be well advised to consider them, that we would not have to suffer from them. Hey, Chris, can you find me that clicker thing? I don't think it's up here. Thanks. Um, but as we're going to look at this, I was thinking about how sometimes things can look good on the outside, but they're not necessarily good on the inside. Any of you who have purchased a house may, may know what I'm talking about. Hopefully you didn't buy one of those money pit houses. If you knew you were going into a fixer-upper, that's one thing. But you can look at a house, and it can look great on the outside, and then they have an inspection. And inspection is a good thing, not always when you're selling your house. You find out things that the previous inspector just didn't catch. But if you find out that the house that you are buying or wanting to buy has termites, that's an issue you want cleaned up ahead of time. If it has dry rot, that's a significant issue that needs to be taken care of. If it has a faulty foundation, you might want to go a different route. Because there are things that you can't see at first glance that can lead to a big problem with the house. And it's, we, can't, we can't just ignore these things. You obviously want to fix them or you want them to be put in order or else we have to suffer the consequences. Um, my sister, when they went to sell her house, apparently the... She lives up in Oregon, but the initial inspector didn't do a very good job. And when she just went to resell it, all of these items, which should have been caught early on, were now coming to light. And they had to fix, put thousands and thousands of dollars into the roof, into the foundation, into a lot of areas that should have been taken care of before they ever moved in. And sin is the same way in our life. When we allow it to, to be there, the consequences can be extreme, and they're very extreme in the life of King David. And we talked about last week about his sin with Bathsheba which culminated in the murder of Uriah. And obviously those consequences were very extreme. A man lost his life. But following that time, God removed partially his hand of protection from David and said, there are consequences. There's active judgment, and there are now going to be consequences of your mistakes and of your sin. And we want to, we want to learn from this. We don't, we don't have to go the same way. God's word is a, is a lamp and a light to show us how we can act and how we can live in a world that is dark and without direction. And it's not just direction because this is how we should act as holy people to follow a holy God, but it is also very practical that God's words make sense. That when we follow his ways, things tend to work out better. Now in a fallen world, we can still have the repercussions of other people's sin. But we don't want to be a part of that, to pass on our own mistakes to our children, to our friends, to our communities. So we're going to look this morning uh, again at the life of David. Please join me again in prayer. We'll just ask that God would speak this morning. Lord, we come before you and we do ask that you would speak through your word, um, through the life of David. And see how even a godly man could, could have such severe sin and consequences in his life. And I pray that we would indeed take to heart the mistakes that he made, that we might not repeat them. And that with your Holy Spirit, you would give us the power to live lives that glorify you and bring you honor. And this morning, I pray that you would give us understanding. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we go to the next slide up here, we're, we're looking for my remote. So if I have to manually ask you to, people to go, no problem. If it, if it goes. Is there a next slide? 
All right. There, there hypothetically is going to be a next slide at some time. I'll show this big broken down home, which we're kind of tying into my opening illustration. But what we see is that David, King David, had, we said, adultery with Bathsheba. And it was because of that, God had said, you are going to suffer the consequences. Through the, Nathan the prophet comes to David and tells him, the consequences are going to be very severe. This starts very early. The first thing to happen is that the baby that was conceived in this affair um, with Bathsheba um, does not live. The baby dies. And God says, when David is praying, he reveals to David, he goes, I'm not going to spare this child. Now, we know that God cares for infants, and, and we can't do justice to the entire everything that's happening in this short look at David's life. And, and Jesus Christ himself who says, you know, suffer not the little children for such is the kingdom of God. Let them come unto me. And, and all of these verses. Uh, in this life, it seems like a, 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 an innocent party is suffering for the sin of the father. But you know what? That's the way that sin works. Make no mistake about it. The, one of the biggest lies that you hear is, oh, you know what? Why don't people just live me alone? It's my life. It's not affecting anyone else. You know, that would be great if that's how it worked, but that's not how it works. I'm sure many of you in this room bear the scars of wounds that other people's sin affected you greatly. And some of you know that you've done some horrible things, and you know that other people still bear the consequences of what you have done. Sin, it cannot be confined. We used the illustration last week of my friend who used to light a fire for fun. And then it got out of control. But sin burns, and it doesn't just burn the person who started it. And it starts off in his home with that son that was born to him. And David prayed for the son that God might change his mind because he knows God, knew God was gracious. But when he realized that God's decree was permanent, when the child passed, he washed his face, he went and ate, and his servants were confused. I said, why, why are you no longer grieving? He said, well, basically, summary version. You know, God's decree is final. My child is gone. And I cannot go to him yet. And I, and I believe that David has that hope in the Bible, in God's mercy, that he knows he will see him in eternity. But in this, in this lifetime, his, son, his sins cost him that relationship. Unfortunately, it doesn't end there because I believe there's a couple sons that David will not see in eternity. They did not seem to have any fruit of a real relationship with God. And as from watching perhaps David's own sin, perhaps as the whispers go through and seeing the poor example that he was as a father, or maybe there were bad seeds from the beginning. We do know, and we're going to talk about this morning, that David tended to be a neglectful father. He did not appear to be the man that he should have been as a father. Well, it gets worse. See, David did a lot of things that weren't right. David was a good king up to this point, but he was a lousy dad. So many times we can get distracted. All of us are prone to this, men and women both, saying, I'll get, I'll get to raising my kids later. Right now, I've got to buy a house. Right now, I've got to do this. Right now, and sometimes it's even really good things, I've got to serve the Lord. Right now, I have to run a kingdom. But we don't get those years back. We don't get that time back. And David violated the advice that God had given. He's told, he said, when you do not take to the king's many wives, well, David took more than a couple, which means he now has multiple families to keep going on. He's got multiple children. He's got times of battle. He's got a nation to run. And he cannot handle it. He has stepped outside the bounds of what God had said. And now he's reaping the consequences. And maybe he tried to be a good dad. I wasn't there where we have to do some reading between the lines. But the, the fact of the matter was he was not. And so in, in, in the course of time, his oldest son, the firstborn, the man who many probably assumed would be king, Amnon, has... A very twisted attraction to his half-sister, Tamar. And he arranges things in such a way where he sexually assaults his sister. There's, there's no way to say it nicely. And then when he is done, he discards her like yesterday's trash. You go, how can this happen? David is a man after God's own heart. 
And now look at his son. And we know by the Old Testament law that Amnon should be taken out and stoned. We don't know why this doesn't happen. Maybe David feels too much guilt about his own sin that he'll, he feels like a hypocrite. We don't know what he says. The Bible doesn't say what David says to Amnon or what happens behind the scenes. But what it does say is what the full brother named Absalom of Tamar says, which is nothing. It says he said nothing, either good or bad. Because the sin is snowballing. Do you ever do that as a kid? You take a snowball, you go top of the hill, and you roll it down, and you try to see if you can make it create a giant snowball? I mean, it works on cartoons. It doesn't always work so good down here. But uh, especially with our nice powder. You know, it's not that nice wet snow, which is really good when you're shoveling the driveway, by the way. <laughs> we know that. But Absalom begins to conspire in his heart, and you can see his heart hardening just in reading the Scripture. I don't know if there was any shred of goodness in him ever or if he was just a vain, proud young man. But he sees his sister has been wronged. He sees a perpetrator is alive, and he decides to go on a little vigilante justice, and for two years he stews and he waits and he, he just bides his time for his opportunity. And on the surface, he makes it seem like everything's okay. Until one day, he says, we're throwing a party two years later. And the second son, Absalom, murders Amnon. So now, it's got even worse. We have one child who violated a daughter. The other child murdered that child and went in to, to flee with his paternal grandfather. Sin is an ugly business, and we don't realize just how great the consequences can be when we start. We buy the lie is that there won't be consequences. It's just like those credit cards they offered you when you started college. Some of you remember those, right? Oh, you're, you're a grown-up now. Here's a credit card. And pretty soon they're trying to talk. Here's another credit card to pay for that credit card. And some of you have had to deal, navigate those difficult situations because they don't really read the fine print of the interest which is exorbitant. Sin is the same way. The cost is so much more than is advertised. But the bad news is, it's not unlike a credit card. It's not just the person whose name it is in who pays. Everyone pays. And David's home is falling apart. There's dry rot. There's a faulty foundation. David was repentant when he sinned. And there was forgiveness. But there were still consequences. And so when we look at sin this morning, I hope we begin to have a hatred of it. We're so easily enticed by it because it promises so much more than it ever offers. I mean, we wouldn't sin if it wasn't tempting. Correct? We wouldn't sin if there wasn't an initial thrill. If there wasn't an initial promise. But it's the back side of it. It's, it's the part that once it's got you, that is so ugly and so painful and ultimately leads us guilty before God. Well, as time passes, David is grieved, as, as any father would be grieved. He's lost one son. He's had a daughter who has been broken. And his other son who is still living, his, his general Joab arranges and says, why don't you call him back? And he calls Absalom back. But even so, at this point, he doesn't have the wisdom or perhaps the inclination. We don't know what's going on. Maybe he just doesn't want to seem like he's giving approval to what Absalom has done in the past. Or maybe he is just so wrapped up in everything else that he forgets about Absalom once Absalom comes back to Jerusalem. You see, because David was doing many things. He was preparing a temple. He was ruling a kingdom. But we need to consider the obligations that God has given us and as people who are part of a family. That's where we need to start. We need to start with ourselves. And we need to start with our families and be faithful in the small things. Remember the servants who came before in, in the parable that Jesus gave? He says, if you're faithful... In the small things, you'll be given more. So many times we want to be given more. We want to do the big things, but we don't want to be faithful in the small things. And as we've talked many times, I said, it was verses like these that haunted me. I, I had a, a godly father, far from a perfect father. But I knew he cared about my spiritual well-being. 
And that wasn't being sacrificed because he was a pastor as well for the spiritual well-being of the rest of the flock. Unfortunately, many people in the Bible seem to have forgotten that. Well, Absalom is back. He doesn't know why he's back. And his heart has already grown cold. And there's no love lost, apparently, between him and his father. But he does seem to have his father's charisma. And he is an attractive young man, a well-spoken young man. And he begins to look around and maybe even with some justification think, you know, Dad is not running this kingdom so efficiently. Look at what has happened in this house. Seems like it's time for a new ruler, and I think I could be that guy. And Absalom departs from following God, and he now follows a pro ambition and pride. And it says that he begins to sit in the gates. Where is where David should have been? So now, now at this time, he's probably getting ready for the temple, concentrating on spiritual things. But he's not where he should be, which was dealing with his people. So it falls on Absalom, who is dealing with the men coming in the gate, which is where the king of the city would normally sit in those cultures. And that is where Absalom is, seat, is seated. And he is winning the hearts of the people in the court. He is winning the hearts of the people who come in the city. And before David realizes what has happened, he has a full-blown rebellion. And he is forced to flee. Flee Jerusalem. Because here's another lie that we have. There are spiritual things and there are earthly things. Well, you are a pastor. You do spiritual things. You proclaim the word of God. And, and no, no, make no mistake, that is, that is a holy calling. But you know what? Raising a child is a holy thing. And everything you do should be a sacrifice to God. If you are a plumber, and we read this in the New Testament, it says, do your work as unto the Lord, as if he was the one whose house you were fixing. As if your boss was the one, was Jesus Christ himself who commissioned you. It's not, an, it's not a profane calling. It's not mundane. But we are called wherever we go to be faithful servants of the Lord. And whether you are, are the worship leader at a church or whether you sit in the back and sing off key, if there is no difference in terms of the spiritual offering that we give to God. And maybe at this time, I'm assuming that David said, I'm building a temple. He's not really building. He's just preparing for it. Or whatever has him distracted. But raising his family is the highest holy calling he could have had. And then God had committed to him a nation. And that was no less spiritual to deal with tax codes and disagreements between Gad and Issachar or whatever other tribal entities might have had some squabbles at the time. And because he abdicated his responsibility, he is now forced to run. There is a rebellion. And Absalom is a great embarrassment to the family at this point. But God is still on the throne. Make no mistake, God still loves David. Even in all of his failures, God calls David a good king. I don't know about you, but I, I find some consolation in that. Because at this point of David's life, I read this and go, Who's evaluating him? He's a good king. He has a rebellion. He's a horrible father. He murdered a guy. And God, at the end of the days, calls him a good king, which means there might be a little bit of hope for me. Praise God he doesn't see us where we are and just by what we do, but he sees our hearts and what he is making us into. Because when we talk about sin and judgment, sometimes people will go, well, I guess I'm in the sinner, sinner's camp. There's no hope for me. And, and, and write us off. But that's not what God's heart is for us. But in this life, there are consequences. And he wants to protect us from those consequences. And he wants us to be a blessing to others and a good witness to his name and to the gospel. Well, the rebellion is crushed. That's the short story. And Absalom is killed. Absalom loses his life. And now David has lost another child. It's, um, it's a big deal what happened. And I think David unfortunately realized far too personally, I had a moment of weakness, a short period of my life. And so much of my legacy has now been defined by that moment. 
there, there are reasons we meet together as believers. It's, it's not as, as publicly portrayed, and sometimes we even do a bad job of, to be in each other's business because, well, you know, I'm holier than you, obviously, and I have to let you know that you're not as good as me. No, that's not what it's about. But we as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are prone to weakness. We are prone to sin. Then when we are not fellowshipping with one another and praying with one another and lifting one another up, it's very easy to go the way that David went on his detour. And we're not to forsake the f- for sim- assembling together, but to, s- s- to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Unfortunately, it's not over yet. And let's go to the next slide. There's still other trouble in the nation that comes up. Because now that Absalom has shown all of David's enemies, you know what? The kingdom is not as stable as you thought it was. Enemies of David have been allowed to publicly insult him, to humiliate him. And shortly on the heels of this rebellion with Absalom, another one of the, another person who would be king, a man by the name of Sheba, launches another rebellion. And David is sent to, forced to send his army off on the heels of squashing one rebellion to squash another. Sin has consequences. And then at some time, I, there's scholars actually disagree when David did this. Um, at the very end of the book, David makes one final mistake. And uh, whether it's written chronologically or not, the point is the same. But he decides one day, let's count the people in the nation. Not too long ago, we did a census. Some of you even may have had part-time jobs for the census, right? That's what countries do. We count how many people are in states and in counties and nations. But God had told the people of Israel that they weren't to count their people like the other nations did. And in fact, when there was a census, we read in the book of Exodus, that God let them know that the people belonged to him. And there was a certain offering that was supposed to be given. And because what the kings would do at that time is they believed that a man had only had the right to count. You could only count what belonged to you. So in other cultures, you would count what belonged to you. The reason the king could count the people, he was showing ownership. And so whether David was thinking this or not, it didn't matter. This is what it communicates to the cultures around, to the nations around. He is basically saying when he starts to count these people, these are my people. And God wants it to be known, David, they are not your people. I put you in a position of leadership over them. They are my people. That's why they gave an offering to God during a census. And even Joab, and if you know anything about Joab, we've barely touched on him in this series. Joab is not have a very godly heart. He is a very mercenary approach to life. He murders people who are better than him if they get in the way of his military aspirations. Not a good guy. But even Joab at this moment goes, um, excuse me, David. He's a guy who had no problem being complicit in murdering Uriah. But right now he goes to David and says, I don't think this is the best idea. Let's not count the people. If Joab is counseling you towards righteousness, and if you have a Joab in your life, when someone who's prone to give you bad advice says, I think you're going too far, that should be a wake-up call. But David goes on with it and then realizes the greatness of his error. And the Lord says in chapter 24, That you, David says to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done, but now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I've done foolishly. And in verse 12, God speaks back and says, I offer you three things. Choose one of them from yourself that I will do it to you. He says, you know what, you have done very foolishly. And when leaders sin against God, the consequences are more extreme. Because they lead many people astray. He says, I give you three consequences. I'll either, there's going to be seven years of famine that will come to your land. Or three months where your enemies will have victory over you. Or three days where there will be a deadly plague which will run across the land. David says, I'm in great distress. These are not good options. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. There's some wisdom there. He says, I understand the consequences are going to be severe because God is just, and this is a time for justice instead of mercy. 
but I know that God is still merciful. Whereas if he let my enemies run over me, there would be no mercy. And so for three days, a plague sweeps a nation, and it says, and 70,000 men died. Can you think of that? 70,000. That's a huge number today. And David is grieved when he sees it as happening. He says, surely I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, and he's talking about his people, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and my father's house. You see that David does not want the people to suffer from his misdeeds. But unfortunately, and that's what I want us to understand about sin, whether it's a direct judgment judgment of God or not, people will suffer for our sins. It's not just us. I've told you before, while I was very blessed to have a godly father, his father was not a godly man and abandoned the family, and left them hanging in the wind. And as very much older men, as I talk with my uncles and aunts, you can still see the hurt. Oh sure, Grandpa just wanted to chase the life of the endless party. And he realized when he was an old man that he had played the fool. And he repented. But that did not undo what had been done. And this is not to rub your nose in your sins. That I, I know we feel guilty sometimes, and we're not, we didn't come here to make you feel worse. But what we wanted to say is, there is a better path. Don't go down the path that leads to destruction. It's wide, but choose life. Choose life. Because as we look at this next slide here, what I want us to consider are, of what we can take from this, and number one is that we need to prioritize godliness. Godliness has great gain. There's a great gain in it. And we'll pull up this verse right here. So if you can pull up that verse, that'd be great. It says, you, man of God, flee, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. What did he say? If you are a man of God, pursue godliness. In 1 Timothy 6.11. And it's actually talking in contrast to what others pursue. If you backed up to verse 10, it says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves with many sorrows. He says, a lot of people pursue other things. And what happens? They pierce themselves with sorrow because they do not pursue godliness. And what happened with David when he went after other things than God? He went after the lust of the flesh when he saw Bathsheba. He went over the pride of life when he wanted to count his troops. And he was pierced. He says, but pursue godliness. Because we know, we know that when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings death. And God wants us to live. In the book of Deuteronomy, he says, look, I give a choice to you. A blessing and a curse, life and death. Choose life. Choose life. In 2 Peter, we also read, and it's not up here, but it's in the Bible, 2 Peter 3.11. It says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, the world, its pleasures, its passing distractions, everything that we see. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And Jesus Christ himself would, self said, what good does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? That's not a good trade. I, I, I was discussing this with our children as we read their nighttime Bible stories. I said, Garrett, Matthew, would it make any sense if I said, I will give you $5 million, but at the end of the day, I'm going to kill you? And in their little faces, and even their little ages go like, no, I don't want that. But we do that, don't we? We, we think, I'm just going to indulge pleasure and forget what's to come. And we also see that what we reap, we sow. In Galatians 6, 7, we'll put this up here on the board. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Sometimes people talk about this thing, and they're like, well, that's just karma. Well, there's not karma, okay? It's, karma is this belief that the universe just kind of measures things out and equal. If you do good things, you get good things. You do bad things, you get bad things. That's, that's a belief in karma. It's impersonal, just balancing it out. But there is a thing called recompense, which means good deeds 
will be rewarded by God in, in a good way and evil deeds in an evil way. You, there will be judgment. Now, not all of the payday is today. And thankfully, a lot of the bad deeds, for those of us who put our trust in Christ as we celebrate around the Lord's table, Jesus Christ said, I will pay for their eternal sin, that they may be reunited with God, that they may be his children, that they can come into his kingdom and live in his pleasures forever. But that doesn't mean that in this lifetime, we may not have to suffer from some of the things that we've done. Because while God forgives and God heals, the scars remain. And people may not forgive. Another thing I learned from David and his mistakes, and, and there are many, is that we need to prioritize family. I, I just read, what good would it what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? What good is it for a man to gain the whole world but lose his family? Now, children will make their own choices. They will. They have their own will. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden. Sometimes they say, I'm going to go this direction to the best parents in the best circumstances with everything given to them. And some children with the worst parents turn out to be godly saints because we do have a will. And each one of us is going to be accountable for our own decisions regardless if we had good parents or bad parents. However, shouldn't we as people who have God's heart do whatever we can to stack the odds that they might pursue God and godliness? And we'll bring up this next verse here. In Deuteronomy it says up here on the screen, take heed to yourself. And this is Moses speaking to the people. And diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And the important part, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. David forgot this, I'm assuming. I know we have to try to connect some of these dots. It doesn't give everything that happened. But his children, at least the ones that were born when he was younger, seem to have been neglected. Some of you may say, this is my story. And we're not here to rub anyone's nose in this. But if that's the case, look at the next part. It says, and your grandchildren. Maybe you have a second chance with the next generation. Or maybe you have a second chance with a friend's kid or a neighbor's kid or someone who's maybe even older than you but can become a spiritual son. John Wesley was a great man of God. But he was a horrible husband. Now there's more to it than that. He really wasn't cut out for to be a family man. He was consumed. He was married to the ministry. And if that's the case, he should have heeded Paul's advice and say, then it's better for him not to marry. Because if I can't be, and it says this in the Bible, in terms of elders and overseers of the church, if you can't manage your own family well, then you shouldn't be an overseer. Because that's the first priority. Not only is it a proving ground, but also, and it's not all, always your fault. If my kids are misbehaving just because they're horrible little urchins that are related to their dad, then you know what? I need to step down even not as a, oh, shame on you, your kids are horrible. But I need to step down because while I still have a say in their life, I need to give them my best effort. And if I can repair it during that time, I need to. They may go their own way, but I can't sacrifice their lives, which is my first commitment, to do the ministry because it can't be this ego trip like, well, God has called me here. He needs me. Let me let me clue you in. You guys know this. God doesn't need me. God just kind of humors me. And I, I always go like this. Um, I look in the mirror many times and I know a lot of you do too. You go, am I, am I really the best that you had for this at this time? Seriously? I think that with my own kids. Like, really? really. I mean, there's got to be a better father than me out there. But God, and we, and we, we do. We see God is the one who gives the growth. God is the one who touches the heart. God lets us be a part of it, but he doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. So keep your pride in check and do what he's called you to do. And if at some time your family needs all of your attention, then give them all your attention. Oh, bring them to church. Don't huddle away. They, they need, you need the body of Christ to help you. But David gave the nation his attention, gave the temple planning his attention. And he lost his older children. And it was a child who was born to him when he had grown some wisdom and some experience who would be Solomon who would start off in his footsteps. I believe he learned. That's just my guess. But what a cost. What a cost.
And then finally, let's bring up the last verse here. Um, we, need to, we need to get out of our own way. In James, it talks about being humble, which was tying into what I just said. We're not that important. We're not. Remember, if we look at 1 Corinthians, what does it say? God chose what? The great people, the spiritual people, the wise people, the powerful people. Is that what it says? No, it says God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And I look in the mirror again and go, well, if you're looking for foolish things, I guess I am really good. I am foolish and I am weak and I am simple. But God, if you can use foolish, weak, and simple things, then I'm your man. But when we think that God needs us and start thinking we're so great and God couldn't possibly live without us and we need to count our people even though God said not to, that's when we get in trouble. And so remember the words of James. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And I've shared this before because I think it's just such a great Ego check. And whether you like his music or not, and I don't know him as a person, I don't know whether you know he's a really easy guy to get along with or whether he has diva tendencies, but Michael W. Smith at a concert I heard him years ago say during a question and answer time, how, how do you keep your ego from getting out of control when you pack out stadiums and people are excited to pay to see you? And he said, well, I remember this verse in the Bible, James 4.10. He says, humble your, yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So I figured there's two jobs there. My job is to humble myself. God's job is to lift me up. And what I found in my life is when I do God's job for him, try to lift up myself, he gets to do my job and humble me. He says, and um, God does his job a lot better than mine. So I'd rather take care of the humbling myself and let him deal with the lifting me up. And, and I, think, I think there's some very common wisdom there. You know, um, and we can go to the last slide here. D David's, David's sin, what I wanted us to see this morning is just how ugly sin is. You know, we're all a part of it. There's no one here who's not a sinner. Don't, make no mistake. Whether in the world's eyes you're a big sinner or a little sinner, all of us, what we have done, put Jesus Christ on the cross. Because sin kills. And it did. It killed Jesus Christ. But to those who put their trust in him, he gives life. And he gives forgiveness. And Romans 6.23 is clear. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so it's not an end statement. There's hope. You can't earn your way to a relationship with God. You can't be good enough or spiritual enough. Because it's not how good you are, it's how guilty you are. And the bad news is we're all guilty. But Jesus Christ died for sinners. That whoever would put their trust in him and say, I believe that you died for my sins. And by placing my trust solely in that, I can have the relationship with God that I was created to have. If you would choose to take his offer. Sin kills. But Jesus offers life. But for those of us who believe him and trust him and have come to know him, as much as it is possible, we should have nothing to do with sin that we should not partake in it anymore. David's sin affected his family and his entire nation. He couldn't contain it. The results were long, long lasting. It hurt David. It hurts us. It kills so I pray that we would indeed love holiness and love God and turn to him that he might make us into what we should be. And just as a closing thought, while the natural course of sin is death and sin deserves judgment, I am more amazed than ever how many times in my own life I've seen how God has spared me from so many consequences, which I'm sure I deserve. And I'm not just talking about eternal consequences, what Christ has done on the cross. Make no mistake, God is merciful. We sow evil seed, and sometimes it doesn't come, it doesn't grow. And that can be nothing less than God's mercy. And sometimes we reap the results of other people's sin. And we see how much that hurts us. Well, let's not do that to others. Not because we're better. <laughs> 
but because Jesus Christ can make us into something better. He gives us life and hope. And in the person of David, as we're wrapping him up, I'm going to move to Solomon. We do see that one thing he did right. He came before God on both of his major occasions and said, I have sinned. Do to me as is fair. And God showed mercy. Well, not, not necessarily the positive, uplifting message uh, that we you like to go. Some people go, well, I went to church and I'm feeling worse because we talked about sin. Well, you know what? In order to get the good news of the gospel, you have to understand the prognosis. The prognosis is that we are sinners in need of a Savior. The good news is this isn't like you go to the doctor and you have a death sentence. This is going in and saying there is a cure. Jesus Christ is here to heal you from your sins. Not only to begin putting your life back together in this world, but to offer you eternity with him where we will no longer struggle with these bodies of sin and the imperfections that are caused by it. Let's pray. God, we come before you today and, and we see just the tragedy that was so much of David's life. And I pray that you would give us wisdom by, by observing what he had done, that you would, you would give us strong convictions and the power of your spirit to pursue you and that you would give us the ability to be a blessing to our families and to others. And God, I do pray that if there's anyone here who, who still does not know you and what you have done, that you would convict them of the truth of who you are and what Jesus has done on that cross, that they might know you and find salvation and healing. Lord, we know we cannot be perfect and we need you so badly. So I pray you would help us to be good witnesses and enable us to bring honor to your name. We ask this in Jesus' name.